This is Dr. Caitlin Kite from the Academic Development Team. And I'm assuming that if you're watching this movie, you have already taken the introductory course, which was about some basics and essentials in communication. Or perhaps you already know those things and now you're diving in. Either way, the idea is that you hopefully do have some foundational knowledge of communication and now you are ready to start considering your own context and thinking about how best to apply those. I'm going to start off by introducing the concept of consilience. And this is perhaps something that you've not heard of before, or if you have, it's not something that you necessarily have applied to the context of communication. Now, consilience is an idea that has been around for a while, but it perhaps most recently was really advocated for, obviously, by E.O. Wilson, who wrote a book by this name in the 90s. And he was interested in the concept of consilience because it really explores transdisciplinarity. So it's thinking about how there are overlap amongst different areas of inquiry. And he was interested in applying that overlap and harnessing that overlap in the area of conservation because conservation itself does involve lots of different types of knowledge and applications of knowledge and so it's a field ripe for consilience. But actually consilience is something that I think most of us can see and experience in our daily lives even if we are not doing research that is itself um, consilient if you like. As an interdisciplinary researcher myself, I've always found it really difficult to think of different areas of knowledge as being really discrete. And that feeling has only increased as I've gone on and as I've done, uh, done more communicating and more education. And I think that not only is consilience interesting, uh, for the sake of variety, thinking about dabbling across boundaries, but it's also really where you can start to make magic, I think, when you are exploring research communication. And that's because the people that we encounter out in the world probably aren't in our discipline. They are probably from another discipline or they have interests in a variety of disciplines. And so they are bringing uh, quite a lot of knowledge from many different areas and different types of knowledge than what we typically have. And so you can start to have really interesting conversations as they are understanding what you're saying from very different perspectives and in very different ways than you might have expected. And this allows you to really start thinking about what kinds of metaphors can you apply in order to communicate effectively and what sorts of things can you learn from them and then apply elsewhere in other types of communication. And it's not just thinking about the particular language that you're using and the conversations that you're having, but also the ways in which you are beginning to provide all of that information and the context in which you're starting to engage in communication. You can learn about these other areas and see examples by talking to colleagues, by visiting museums, by following people on social media, by reading really widely, and so on. And I think that it's really, really important, if you are interested in communication, to consume really widely, because that is how you start to learn about all these diverse viewpoints and experiences and uh, modes of communication. That's where you get inspiration. That's why, where you find other possibilities. And that's how you start to understand ways of thinking. Uh, some of the most useful work I've ever done has been as an editor. And when you start working uh, as an editor, you not only get to learn about the things that people are writing about, but you're also learning how people communicate, you're seeing what good communication looks like, you're seeing what bad communication looks like, and all of those are things that you start to then pull through into your own work. And I've definitely seen that from editing work, how it's moved into my own writing, and I also have noticed that in terms of social media outreach that I do, in terms of visual artwork that I do. I think people who are musicians, for example, when you start off, you learn your scales, you start copying some other artists, and little by little, you become more and more independent, and suddenly you can write your own music, and you can come up with something brand new. You can engage in uh, more improvisation as you go, and that's exactly what you would start to see in the realm of communication and science communication, research communication specifically. So the more widely you're engaging in all these different sorts of things, the more you can educate yourself and pull those rules through to apply in your own life. 
I'd like to now ask you a couple of questions. And obviously, we're not together in person, so you'll just have to think about these and answer them on your own. Uh, and it's, it's unfortunate that we can't be together so that you can see what other people are saying as well and have a conversation around that. But even just to do this on your own is really helpful. And actually, if you do have a little cohort, if you have a lab group, if you have some colleagues that you work with, it can be really interesting to have this conversation with them, especially if they are likewise interested in communication uh, and creativity. So the questions I'd like to ask, ask you to look at what best describes you in, in the list I'm about to provide. So which of these following terms, and you don't have to pick just one, maybe you can rank them in order, which of them really leap out as best describing you? So you can pause this and have a think about that and pick out which of these you really engage with most and, and feel most connected with. And then you can go on to the next slide. Now I'd like to ask a follow-up question. And again, this is thinking about how do these things apply to you? Which of the following do you most enjoy? And again, you can pick out just the top two or three that leap out at you, or you could perhaps rank all of these and see most to least, which of these are most appealing to you. So again, you can pause the video if you like, take a bit of time and then move forward whenever you're ready. So those are just some of the questions that are suggested in the book, Conscious Creativity. And that book seeks to help you to understand your own creativity better, and then to enhance it while also helping you to explore new avenues. It's a great example of the sort of book that you could read if you wanted to find some more creative stuff to do. So for example, multimedia research communication. But if you don't feel like you're particularly inventive or artistic or creative, or if you think you are creative, but you've kind of tapped out all your options in one area and now you want to move on to something new that you haven't considered before. And this is just something that really gets you to, to think about communication and to think about art in a whole different way, and it injects a lot of variety. Another nice book to think about is the one here on the right, which is Unflattening. And this book talks about why it's so important to value and pursue creativity alongside other more serious work. And in case, and in, in fact, this book actually is a case study itself because it is a, a doctorate that has been drawn in graphic novel form. It's the, the first one to ever have done this. And then it was published, and it's really fantastic because it thinks about how the medium in which we're communicating really can impact how we ourselves are thinking and also how other people think. And if we can open ourselves up to looking through different media and, and multiple media and pushing the boundaries, then suddenly we can start exposing ourselves to new ideas. And I think that these sorts of things are really important to, to look at, even if it feels like it really has nothing to do with your field of research, with your everyday life, with the sort of communication that you think you want to do, simply because it helps you to push your boundaries and it helps you to find a new sort of consilience. And that can then help you to connect better with your audience and to find different ways of connecting and to be more adaptable when you're looking at doing that. And this will all help you to just explore ideas in new ways and to open new doors so you're not repeating the same old thing. And if nothing else, if you do find something in here that kind of inspires you, it can then help you to create something that does stand out from the crowd. Because I'm betting that most other people in your discipline aren't going to be approaching communication in this sort of way. So if you are, then you're almost inevitably going to produce something that is different and that will be eye-catching and that can help you to be more impactful. I'd now like to ask you another question that hopefully you can um, take a pause on and, and think about before proceeding. And that question is here at the top of the screen. What forms of communication are you producing? So in the introductory video, if you watch that, I was talking about signals and cues and asking you to think about what signals do you give off and what cues do you give off. So you might remember some of the things you thought about there, but this is a slightly different question, and so it might bring up different answers as well. So just take a moment now 
30 seconds, a minute, and jot down as many different forms of communication as you can think about that, that you actually produce in your daily life in the course of doing your research and, and going about your business. So here is my cheat sheet list. And this is probably not exhaustive, but I sat down and tried to think about all the different sorts of things that I uh, engage with on a daily basis or have put out in the world that people could access on a daily basis. I mean, obviously, I'm not writing a new CV every day, but I do have it posted on my web page online. So these are all things that just a regular researcher, a regular academic might have as a form of communication that they're producing in the professional context. These things take place all over. So this might be happening in your office, at a conference, at a meeting, online, in physical public spaces, and so on. And each of those will then have its own considerations in terms of social norms um, and, and, and what we tend to expect and what we tend to desire, and also with uh, the process involved. So how you go about providing this information, presenting it, interacting uh, around it. For each of these, we all have to strike a balance. So we know that there's going to be that social norm in terms of what we're expected to do, what we're supposed to do, but we also want to be innovative and stand out from the crowd and be true to ourselves. So the CV is a really good example. We know that there's an accepted format. There are certain categories that we need to have on there. There are certain pieces of information that we need to include, but you know that your CV is going to be looked at along with dozens of others when you apply for a job. And so you want your CV to somehow look a bit different and to catch someone's eye and to be notable in some fashion, not for a bad reason, but for a good reason. So how do you toe the line while also innovating? And this is basically what we have to ask ourselves about all forms of communication. How can we do um, what we want to do, what feels right, while we're also more or less within um, the socially accepted boundaries and we're not distracting people too much by going you know, too far outside the box. I now want to give you another task, a longer task, and this is um, not to answer that question because I don't think there is a definitive uh, answer to that question. This is something that we all have to come up with on our own as we go through each project, but that's the part that I think we can start to tackle here. I want you to start thinking about the different projects where you might need to be solving this problem so that you can th think about it in advance and have a plan and start to um, open yourselves up to particular opportunities to learn about this and to answer those questions as you go. I think that a really good first step when you're doing any sort of um, communication, even if it's just a one-off, is to have some sort of a plan. So not in the traditional sense necessarily where you're thinking about your target in a campaign or a message, but more like a career roadmap. So you can get a sense of where you are now and where you'd like to get and the key milestones in between. It's also, I think you could think of this as like a developmental map, um, a PDR type of thing. So this is something that will allow you to think about uh, what you need to accomplish and what you want to gain experience with and also the things that you want to do just for fun. So you can start accumulating all of this, thinking about where you have strengths and weaknesses and understanding what, where you might need to develop. And as you do that, and as you're then hopefully consuming different options, as I suggested at the beginning, and asking yourself questions about what do I want, you can start to hone in on the answer that I asked in the last slide and figure out how to solve each of those communications problems in real life. So I have provided a template and I would suggest that you now open that or download it and print it, whatever is comfortable for you. On one side of that template, you can start to label your milestones so you can put them uh, at appropriate distances or you can have them evenly spaced if you're not quite sure if something's going to take three months or eight months or whatever. So whatever is comfortable for you, just get a sense of all the different milestones that you'd like to hit in which order. And you can look, let's say, at about the next five years, because that's what a typical um, performance review would look at. So let's just take about five years. And then on the opposite side of that line, you can think about what do you want to achieve there? So how will you know that um, this project is complete? So let's say that you want to 
reach out and make connections with uh, certain stakeholders, you would know that that's complete when you've got, let's say, um, X, Y, and Z groups that you have made contact with. So it's just kind of explaining in slightly more detail what you've labeled on the other side and will give you a clearer, more full picture. You can then also jot down how much you already know in terms of what you need to do to achieve this. So if you're going to be reaching out to those stakeholders using emails and newsletters, then maybe you feel pretty comfortable with that format already. And so your level of confidence and, and comfort is like a 9 out of 10. But let's say that that's something uh, a little bit fancier. It's something maybe that involves some... Um, skills that you don't have, like maybe you want to be using a layout program in order to make the newsletter look particularly fancy. It's not just a printed up A4. You want to have pictures and you want it to have multiple pages and it's going to be going off to the printer so it looks a bit more professional. Well, maybe you need, then need to learn about that program and develop those skills. So that's what the third part is for. You can jot down how much, if any, further development you might need in order to be able to produce what it is that you want. So Look at those um, templates, look at these tasks right here, and I've also provided a filled out version so you can see what I'm talking about, so you get a sense of how yours might look. Pause the video and take 10, 15 minutes, whatever is necessary for you, to fill that out and start getting a sense of the sorts of comms that you want to do, where you are in terms of your journey and, and comfort with the different skills you need and what other development you might need going forward. And then when you're done, you can move on to the next slide. Having done one task, you're now being thrown right into another. I want you to have a go now at developing your elevator pitch. Now the elevator pitch is something that I mentioned in the first video in passing very quickly. And so I want to come back to it now and talk about it in a little bit more detail. The elevator pitch is something that a lot of us have to do, whether we realize that that's what it is or not, or whether we call it this or not. And basically, it's just a really brief summary of our work. And we might adapt that summary depending on who we're talking to, but more or less, it tends to have the five bullet points that you see here on the screen. Some information about who we are, some background or context, perhaps some indication of the connection between uh, you and the person that you're talking to. There's usually an action point, so what is it that you want to do going forward out of this conversation, or why are you there at that event? Whatever the action point looks like uh, might vary depending on the context, but there usually is some sort of uh, follow-on thing. And then there's a finale of some sort to, to bring it to a close. And usually all of this, I mean, the whole idea of the elevator pitch is that you're in an elevator, you're not going too far. So usually you've only got about 30 seconds long to do this or about 65 words. So there's not a whole lot of time or space, which is why it's really important to have your elevator pitch prepared and to practice it and to be ready with what you want to say to people in different contexts. Now, this is related to that last task because this is a really important first step in developing the way that you're going to act on various tasks that you might have come up with in your comms plan. As you're carrying those things out, you're going to have to be summarizing your research. You're going to have to be talking with people. You might be asking for money from people. And all of this comes down to your ability to succinctly introduce yourself and introduce your project. So working on an elevator pitch is a really useful thing to help you start to hone your skills in making that quick summary and also being concise and having really good communication. And this is something that you can take outside in many different contexts and use, for example, at conferences, you can use it at outreach events, you can use it at meetings when you're meeting new uh, folks that you're networking with and so on. So it's just quite a general um, useful skill. Now, the link here, which I also will link to underneath this video, goes to a nice YouTube summary that looks at elevator pitches in more detail. And um, it's a bit energetic, the YouTube video, but I think it is also really informative and helpful. It's just five minutes long or so, and you can see someone work through how you create the elevator pitch and what it should contain. And that description is a little bit specific to one context, but as you can see here in the bullet points I provided, you can generalize that to yourselves. So watch the video and then use 
uh, the provided worksheet underneath the video to come up with your own pitch. And you can think, if you like, of, of a specific circumstance. Um, so for example, you want to get funding, you want to convince the BBC to put you on air, you want to impress a potential collaborator or a future boss. Whatever it looks like for you, use that context to develop your pitch. And when you're ready, you can pause the video and do that, and then press play again and come back and move on. Now that you have hopefully worked on your elevator pitch, you are ready for the last task of this session, and that is reviewing an oral presentation. When you were doing your elevator pitch, I'm assuming that you'll have had to practice even just a little bit to make sure that you were hitting that 30 second mark. And as you were practicing, you may have noticed that there were some things you were doing that you wish you weren't doing, and you felt a little bit embarrassed or a little bit uncomfortable, or you realized that it made you go too short or too long. And if that did happen to you, then you were like pretty much everyone else. And that's because to give an oral presentation requires actually quite a lot of practice and expertise, and you do have to work towards that. It does not happen naturally to the vast majority of people. And that's why I want to now take a step back and think about that here. And I do think this is relevant to everyone and not just people who actually want to do oral presentations for their research communication. I think that we all use oral presentations in some manner or another in our professional lives and in our private lives. I don't even have to be talking here about um, things with PowerPoints. I'm talking about just speaking in general. But it is quite useful if you are doing it in your SciComm as well. There are some really good tips here for people, no matter their context, no matter their profession. And I do find that just as there can be consilience across different fields, you can also have it within one field. So where you start to feel stronger in one area of communication, it can help other areas of communication as well. So even if you're thinking, well, I just want to paint art as my science outreach, I want to send tweets, I don't care about oral presentation, I do think that thinking about this here can help those. And likewise, working on those can perhaps help you here. So just engage with all of these and, and I think you will find that they do support each other. But that is enough talking, let me now introduce this task. So underneath this main video that you're watching now, there will be a linked second film, and that film is of me. I have recorded myself doing a presentation and there are some things in there that I might be doing well, there are some things that I might be doing not so well. So I would like for you to watch that and you might find hopefully that some of what I'm actually talking about is useful. So you can pay attention to what I'm saying but also pay attention to how I'm saying it all. What I'd like is for you to really be thinking about the strengths and weaknesses of the presentation more than uh, the content itself. So use the provided mark sheet and keep track of what you think I'm doing well and not so great. And then once you finish that, think about your top three tips for making an oral presentation impactful. So those probably will be inspired by the things that you saw that were better or worse in that video. And then once you've thought of those three tips, go to the Padlet using the link uh, provided down below and also it will be beneath the, the videos. Click that link and you can go and share. Just add a new box and put in each of your three ideas. However, I would suggest that if someone else has beaten you to it and have already they've already mentioned one of your ideas or all of your ideas, see if you can think of some others because I'd like to try to get as many different ideas as possible and then you guys can see those and use each other's suggestions and perhaps take those forward. Now, I'm going to come back to this slide in just a moment, but I want to take a time out and think about good feedback, just very briefly. The reason I want to look at feedback is that this is an important concept that will have implications for other aspects of communication, and we will come back to the idea of communication in subsequent videos within this uh, overall series. And this is important because I've, I've given you a task where I've asked you to think about strengths and weaknesses. And really that is what you're doing whenever you mark someone and, and prepare to give them feedback. So a really helpful way of doing that is to focus on three things. To focus on what worked, what wasn't so great, and how it could be improved. And this is something that I would ask you to keep in mind as you're keeping track of things on the mark sheet and coming up with your top tips. Because even if you're not going to be giving me the feedback per se about what you think I should improve, 
if you are of that mindset, then you might be seeing things and making connections that could be useful for yourself or useful for colleagues or useful for students. And it's just much more helpful rather than thinking of good versus bad to then think about a rule that you could apply in the future to avoid the bad and work towards the good. And this will help, I think, to be uh, developmental for you as well. And you can see here there's an infographic that's quite small on the screen, but that is linked to uh, below the video again so that you can have a copy and pull it up and look at it in more detail. And this infographic thinks about all the different characteristics of good feedback. So just in terms of thinking about good feedback more broadly, this might be something that you want to uh, employ in the future. All right, so now I'm going to bring you back to the main task slide so you can remember what it is you're supposed to do, and I'm going to leave you to pause the video and get on with it. Okay, so hopefully you have now taken your time out to watch the demo, to make your top three tips, and to share them on the Padlet. Now, obviously, because I'm not with you in the moment. I had no idea what you were going to suggest. I have no idea of what you were paying attention to. So I have had to come up with my own list of what I think were strengths and weaknesses, not just in that video, but overall. And when I did that, I found that they tended to fall into one of three categories. So I'm going to move on to the next slide and look at what I think are the three keys to good communication. So looking across all of the things that I pinpointed in that particular presentation and that other students have pointed out in the past and that I have read about and seen elsewhere, I have come up with three main categories and I think that if you focus on these three areas, you can be pretty confident in any oral presentation that you're giving. So the first is preparation. Then we've got what I'll call presence. And finally, we've got what I'll call performance. And obviously I've chosen these because of a, a bit of alliteration there, but I do think that these kind of roughly summarize across what actually is quite a lot of variety in each one of these sections. So when I'm thinking about preparation, I'm considering things like finding the story, which I talked about in that introductory slide, thinking about the right style for you. So that's maybe not just slides, but also thinking about um, you know, should you be using slides at all? How are you uh, discussing this with people? Is there jargon involved? Is it more comfortable and laid back? And so on. Thinking about supporting materials, the space that you're in, putting in the time to rehearse so that you know that it's going to be a smooth delivery. And also, and I know this seems a bit cheesy, just taking care of yourself so that you are in the right mindset and you're prepared so that you go in there feeling confident. So all of these are things that I would always suggest when you're preparing for any sort of oral presentation, talk at a conference, uh, a meeting, and so on. Presence, then, thinks about things like um, how you can be paying attention in the moment and, and bringing out the best in yourself and connecting with the audience in order to capitalize on that. I've stolen the word presence from theater and from drama because this is what a lot of people talk about when they're going on stage and a lot of these sessions that we now have where theater experts are teaching people in other professions how to be mindful and in the moment and in charge they term those uh, presence sessions and so I think that's a good word that looks at all of these different sorts of things so all of that nervous energy that you might feel how do you get rid of that uh, and turn that actually into something that you can ride and you can really capitalize on. How can you ensure that you're feeling confident and that you're projecting that confidence? How can you be focused on what you're saying so that your mind isn't so nervous that it's wandering around and you're thinking about what you're going to say but haven't said yet? How can you be responsive and adaptable if your audience is looking bored or if they're going off on a tangent in a conversation and so on? So all of these are things that help you to really be in the moment capitalizing on your own inner strength and, and core knowledge and not worrying about the little stuff that might seem um, to be poised to interfere. And finally we've got the performance itself and this is where you're thinking about are you wandering around on stage, uh, does your voice 
get to the back of the room the way it should? Does it sound a bit nervous and wobbly, or is it nice and strong? Have you put yourself behind the lectern where no one can see you, or are you out with the crowd? Are you articulating and enunciating so that people can actually hear what you're saying? Are you sticking to times? Are you rushing because you're so nervous? Or are you going a bit slow because you're going off on a tangent and, and therefore are you going to run over or run short? So it's all of these sorts of things that have to do with the actual delivery itself. And all of these things are really important and they all impact each other. So for example, if you haven't rehearsed, then you might not have a lot of confidence and that means that your timing is going to be off. And so these are kind of arbitrary distinctions to some extent, but I do think that it helps you to just keep in mind ticking all the boxes as you go through. And obviously, quite a lot of them sound like they relate specifically to oral communication, but also many are relevant for other forms of communication, and you can adapt them for those other contexts. And what we've just done with that video of me, you can also do with videos of yourself. And I know that everyone hates this idea, but it is true that you can get videos of yourself and audio recordings. You can uh, have peer presentations and have colleagues watch you. And it's really, really helpful because you can stand back and start seeing what are the, the, the good things and the bad things and then give yourself some constructive criticism like we talked about in the feedback slide. You can also watch others, so people who are, who are more experienced or people who are less experienced even, so you can evaluate their techniques and see what you can learn in terms of what to do or not to do. And the same is clearly true uh, for written work. As I've said earlier, the, the best thing you can do is read and write and edit and critique, and that allows you to see what works and what doesn't. And all of that takes time. So you need to consume, as we said at the very beginning, you need to look at all different sorts of things and get a sense of what the options are, what looks good and bad within each of those options. You need to practice, you need to analyze, and only when you do that repeatedly will you really internalize all the tips for each of the different media. And when you have those rules embedded in your brain, it means that when something goes awry, you're gonna be able to use your expertise with this kind of mindfulness and presence and improv so that you can give yourself that moment to Re reflect on things and to um, choose the right way forward and to react appropriately. And when you do that, when it becomes an instinctive response, you're going to fall back on these sorts of rules here that you've already learned and really internalized. And that will make you feel much more confident and will allow you to have a, a really professional um, kind of approach to things. With that summary, we have reached the end of this session on considering your own context. So hopefully you're now thinking about where you fit in and where the things that you want to do fit in. You've thought about some um, new and different styles and techniques that you might perhaps pursue as you're considering research communication. And one thing I will add is that underneath this, at the bottom of the section, there are some um, slides, some interactive slides that will show you some further examples of different types of outreach from different disciplines. And hopefully if you look through those, you'll start to get a sense of some of the other multimedia options out there and some other innovations that people have uh, engaged with and have produced. And that will allow you to start seeing what sorts of things you might do as well. All of those are there for you to look at at your own leisure, but you've already created now a comms plan, you've got your elevator pitch ready, and you've thought about oral presentations and maybe some top tips that you can work on uh, and apply yourself next time you go to do something. So all of that is hopefully helping you to feel more confident and more competent in your own communication. And what we'll look at in the next session, which hopefully you are ready to move on to now, is public engagement and taking all of this and really start starting to get it out there for wider consumption with other people. So not just within your discipline, not just in your daily interactions, but actual proper research communication with the public. If you have any questions or comments, you can get in touch with me there. Otherwise, hopefully you can move on to that next session.